In this video, I am going to review the basics of copyright law. Copyright plays an important role in our daily lives, especially now when much of what we do relates to digital content. As students, it is important to understand your rights as a consumer of content as well as a creator of content. I hope this may help clarify some important concepts. A copyright gives exclusive rights to a person who has created something. It could be a book, a video, a song, a poem, a painting, a photograph any literary or artistic work, and in some countries it may even include architectural and other applied arts as well as computer software. As the copyright owner, a person benefits financially if their work is a hit. J.K. Rowling, for example, is a very wealthy author due to the copyright she owns on all of the Harry Potter books. Having exclusive rights means that the copyright holder can do what they want with their work. They can make copies of it, get it translated into other languages, make adaptations to it, for example, allow their books to become a movie or a play, as was the case with Rowling's Potter books. Many creators grant permission to other people or companies to make adaptations of their work. It is a way for them to get a greater financial reward from their intellectual property than they otherwise may have received from the original work. If you write a poem, for example, you can grant permission to, a, to someone to turn it into a song and reap the financial benefits of it being available in another adaptation. According to copyright law, there are two rationales for copyright. The first is utilitarian and encourages new works and is like a financial incentive to promote the progress of science and the useful arts. The other is author's rights, the desire to ensure that attribution is paid to the creator, also called right of paternity. It ensures that the work is kept in its original form without any distortions or transformations, also called the right to protect the work's integrity. So, if you want to take a Beyonce song and remix it, you can't do it without her label's permission. If you did get permission, you would have to purchase a license to use the song, which would be prohibitively expensive. Using copyrighted music illegally in a YouTube video can result in your video being muted or blocked, and your channel may be penalized. Instead, it would be much easier to use music that is in the public domain or through a Creative Commons license. We will learn more about Creative Commons in, the, in another video. A copyright officially exists on a work as soon as the work exists in a tangible form, meaning it has to be written down or otherwise recorded by the creator. It could be a poem on the back of a napkin or a drawing created using an app on a smartphone. Let's say, however, that the creator, let's say it's you, played a few bars of a new song you were working on on your guitar. You had the idea for the song, but you didn't write it down or record it with your phone. Your friend heard you play it, memorized it, and wrote it down or recorded it. It is now their song and they own the copyright. Even though you had the idea for the song, ideas are not protected until they are expressed in some tangible fashion. Not everything is under copyright. The law states that after a certain amount of time, a copyright expires and then the work enters what is called the public domain. Once something is in the public domain, other creators can take that work, make derivatives of it, make copies of it, and are using it without any penalty or paying the copyright holder. A work can enter the public domain in four ways. The copyright expires. The law states that a copyright can't last forever. The holder of the copyright does not renew their copyright or otherwise follow the rules to protect their copyright. The work is not entitled to be protected by copyright law. For example, in the U.S., that is any work created by a federal government employee. The creator allows for the work to automatically be part of the public domain. Creative Commons has a CC0 button that assists authors in making their work available to all without a copyright. There are also what are called exceptions and limitations to copyright. There has to be flexibility for students, for example, to take snapshots of pages in a textbook to study for an exam or you need to download a copy of a journal article from the library databases. These examples fall under fair use, and it means that you can fairly use a creative work if it helps you to acquire new knowledge. 
Here in the U.S., we have what's called the four-factor test. Number one, the purpose and character of the use. Is the use for commercial purposes or for an educational purposes? Number two, the nature of the copyrighted work. Fair use analysis look, looks at certain relevant aspects of the work, including whether it is fiction or nonfiction, because facts are not protected under copyright. Number three, the amount and substantiality of the portion used in relation to the copyrighted work as a whole. In other words, how much of the work is being copied? Also, is it the heart of the work that's being copied or also called substantiality? In Harper and Rowe versus Nation Enterprises, the U.S. Supreme Court held that the Nation magazine quoted what the court considered to be a substantial amount from President Ford's memoir without the permission of the publisher, Harper and Row, The use was found not to be fair. Number four, the effect of the use upon the potential market for or value of the copyrighted work. Does your use of the work deprive the copyright owner of income that they could have made if you purchased the work? Here are two examples. In Rogers versus Coons, a sculptor used a copyrighted photograph as a basis to create wood sculptures which had the qualities of the photograph. He made hundreds of thousands of dollars on the sculptures. The photographer sued, and the sculptor claimed the fair use because the photographer was not going to make sculptures. The sculptor lost. The court sided with the photographer, stating that a potential market for sculptures of the photograph existed. Some lawsuits are too ridiculous to even be considered a fair use case. In the motion picture seven, several copyrighted photographs appear in the background of a scene. The photographer sued the producer of the film for copyright infringement, but the court held that the photographs were fleeting in nature or obscured or out of focus, so it was called a de minimis case, Latin for minimal things, and that the court didn't even conduct a fair use analysis. According to the World Intellectual Property Association, Intellectual property refers to the creations of the mind. Besides copyrights, patents and trademarks are two other forms of intellectual property. Patent law covers inventions. It has to be some new functional development in the field. Patents give the inventor an exclusive right to the invention for a limited amount of time. Trademarks protect logos, symbols, and names, representing a product or brand. Think about the Nike swoosh or the brand name Kleenex. Or even a sound like Homer Simpson's do is trademarked by Fox Television. Trademark law allows companies to protect their brand and its reputation. It also helps to solidify the brand name in the minds of consumers. Well, there you have it. The biggest takeaways from this video are the purpose of copyright, exclusive rights of copyright, the freedom to reuse without permission anything in the public domain, and the importance of fair use. Those concepts should give you a good foundation on copyrights and why they are so important in our daily lives.